Hey, y'all. Welcome to the Outsmart Overeating Podcast. I'm your host, Leslie Hooper. And today I have an interesting topic that I want to discuss with our listeners. Steph, it's something that's been on my mind lately, and I actually posted about it on threads recently. And I really just highlighted this idea that if you haven't lost weight in the last three months, there's probably something wrong with your plan. I feel like with the advent of social media, most dieters are simply collecting hacks, tips, and tricks and trying to lose weight with a bunch of soundbite information as opposed to really having a structured step-by-step plan. Is that also something that you share the same perspective with me on? A hundred percent. And I will say, I love social media for this. The social media has become a great source of information for folks. Unfortunately, it is such an incomplete source of information that people are bastardizing their own like hodgepodge type of plans, their Ikea furnituring, their entire <laughs> plan here and putting it together all wrong. And yeah, sure, like some pieces might be okay, but there's a whole lot that is just not working and it's leading to a lot of frustration. Right. I think I was having a conversation with a client recently about the value of having a customized tailored program. And we were speaking more specifically about strength training and workout design and how it's a lot like ordering a dress on Amazon when you go online and just try to do one of these YouTube videos or download a program from, I don't know, an online fitness influencer. And I'm not shitting on it. It's still a hundred times better than doing nothing at all. But I will say, if you want faster results or something that's really tailored to you, your goals, your body symmetry, if you have injuries, flexibility with whether you're traveling and you need to have a at-home style body workout versus in the gym. I mean, there's just a lot of variability possible when you're working with a mentor who also understands your unique body. And so it's similar to having the address that's customized fit as opposed to just ordering something online. And that's why I want to talk a little bit about the weight loss piece as it relates specifically to having a program like Unstuffed, like, um, I don't know, I think Precision Nutrition likely has one like even a macro counting coach or somebody holding you accountable to calories or whatever the case may be, there is absolutely value in having a step-by-step plan mapped out to your destination. That's just it, right? It's about specificity. So there are some general rules, guidelines, things that work for everyone, you know, the laws of nature and whatnot that are just required. Like, no matter what strategy you choose, there's got to be a calorie deficit or we're not going nowhere. It's just not going to happen. So we've got to figure that out. But beyond that, we really need to be able to say like, here are the generalities. Here are the things that most commonly work and you are a whole human. So if I plug you into generalities, like fingers crossed might be all right. Generally though, we're not going to get optimal results. We're not going to get goal supporting results, you might get some better results than you currently have. And that's, that's great. You know, we're just evolving as people, but it is, it's very different to say, okay, here's who I am. Here's my life here. What's what I value in life. Here's what I don't want to lose. Here are the pieces of myself. I don't want to lose through this process, like maybe date nights or family, you know, pizza Friday or, you know, whatever it is. How do we marry what is important to me and who I am and what I'm ready for with this, the science and what's optimal and the quote unquote rules. And then we figure out a path forward that's for you. So you don't feel like you're constantly failing and struggling all the time. Right. As I always say, playing defense instead of offense. And I think that really is the difference between having a clear cut plan that's tailored to you, your lifestyle your preferences and circumstances. All those things need to be taken into an account. And I will say the the second part of this is many people actually do have a plan, 
they're just really terrible at executing it consistently, which is a different kind of problem. We need to get to the bottom of what is it about that plan that is difficult for you to maintain. So I would argue, is that a psychological barrier or are you just, or have you just created a plan? Or were you given a plan that's unrealistic for your current skill set or availability to implement? What do you think? All of the above, you know, is I sometimes your plan can be the most perfect plan in the whole wide world. You can do it with glitter pens and calendars and markers and stickers and do all the things. But if you don't know how to hold yourself accountable, if you don't know how to troubleshoot, if you don't know how to self-reflect, self-coach, be mindful of where you're getting tripped up, if you're just following blindly and you're not learning anything and then shit hits the fan or whatever, these are so common when it comes to the obstacles that people face. And so it goes into this very all or nothing. I can follow the plan or I can't. And if it's a shit plan to begin with and it's nowhere near the lifestyle that you actually want to live and it's not honoring the values, then you're definitely not going to sustain it long term. And if it is a plan that you could maybe eventually get to, but you don't have the foundational skills yet to follow the plan, which is why we give people habits and then we stack those habits one at a time instead of saying like, here are all the habits, do them all. They're easy on paper, <laughs> but you have to build the foundational skills to get to it. So it is a reasonable plan, but it's not reasonable tomorrow, right? We have to build that muscle through practice and accountability and um, reflection and stuff to be able to sustain those things. So I think it's kind of a little bit of everything. Sometimes it's a shitty plan. Sometimes it's a perfect plan for but not the perfect person to follow it. You know, it just, it just takes time. Also an element of having a perfect plan, but to my previous point, having a bunch of mental clutter, dieting rules and beliefs and ideas that prevent you from executing maybe the quote unquote perfect plan, which we see laid out with our clients at the very beginning of Unstuffed, right? They're bringing their dieting past into a program that is designed to teach them how to eat and think like a naturally thin person. But keep in mind, in order to be a naturally thin person, you don't think or act like a dieter. So these things are kind of at odds, which is why we first have to unlearn so much of our dieting beliefs that actually contributed to our weight gain. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, right out the gate, that's where we have to start. And I know our clients run up against a lot of friction and discomfort early on because of that. But once they kind of let loose, uh, maybe a better way of saying it is let go of some of these rules and beliefs and ideas and start seeing maybe their faulty narratives and how that's been holding them back. Then we start to see a new path carved out and then being able to increase that consistency. But that's a tough hurdle to overcome by yourself because you're really locked in and married that this is the quote unquote right way. You've been doing it for a long time. It's always worked for you, which I, I, I love to kind of help clients see that maybe skipping breakfast hasn't worked for you. <laughs> if we haven't lost any weight in the last six months, that might be what's comfortable. A good example of that is how I recently had a conversation with a client who does this very thing where has a history of overeating in the evenings. So to mitigate the additional calories, start skipping breakfast, right? Because while well, I'm already overeating in the evening, so the one way that I can kind of eliminate or take control of this behavior is by just skipping breakfast altogether. But now subconsciously or consciously, we're already planning for the overeat. And I challenged her. I said, what would the most confident in control version of you be feeling first thing in the morning when you're waking up and you're feeling hungry? Would it be rooted in that fear of like, oh no, I can't eat right now because I'm going to overeat later. And it basically just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, I'm just highlighting one little example here, but there's many, many, many ideas and beliefs and rules that we have married ourselves to that kind of shuts down 
curiosity or exploring new ideas or different ways of doing something. Well, that is the result of being a dieter in the first place. That whole scarcity mindset around delaying and pushing out the meal because you have so many food thoughts and food obsessions throughout the day as someone who doesn't think like a naturally thin person who, you know, when you think about the quote unquote naturally thin folks, food is just one very small part of their day, oftentimes an inconvenient but necessary part. It's not something that controls them, even if they enjoy it, even if they love food, they aren't obsessed with it. It's just not something they think about constantly, whereas dieters think about it constantly. We are thinking about what am I going to eat? What is the optimal thing to eat? What is the weight loss thing to eat? Is this a fat gain food? Is this, am I going to be able to stop once I start? What is my next meal? Well, what are we having for dinner? Because I want to make sure that I have enough calories left over for that. Like it's just such a heavy narrative that happens all the time and dieting trains you to be obsessed with food in this way. So the, you're spot on that the unlearning really needs to come along with the creating these different habits and this new way of thinking. It's like, yes, I can give you the perfect plan. <laughs> I can give you the strategy all day long. But if that voice continues to chirp in your ear, there's no way that you're going to follow it in a sustainable and meaningful manner because you're going to try and diet your way through the program instead of working on these new beliefs and letting them become just kind of, as you say, often, Leslie, the backup dancer in your life instead of the star of the show. Yeah, 100%, which honestly leads me to kind of the, the final piece of why somebody hasn't lost weight in the last three, maybe six months is because they don't actually have this awareness and more importantly, the accountability. And I don't wanna sound like a, an asshole here, but I will just say it is my opinion that probably the number one thing that keeps people unfit, preventing weight loss from happening, feeling out of control around food after years of dieting is, and, and I will say it doesn't really even matter if, if you're someone who, I don't know, wants to get rich, it'll essentially keep you poor, or if you want to lose weight, this will keep you overweight. You want to be in a relationship. This mistake can make you single. And it really comes down to the accountability piece, right? I think it's the most common mistake that people think, but it's also the most obvious. When you actually look at the research, it does show that people are 95% more likely to achieve their goal if they have somebody holding them accountable on a consistent basis over an extended period of time. And I've seen that play out in my own life. I mean, just think about it, Steph. When somebody's paying attention to what you're doing and you have weekly check-ins and they're reading your chart or asking you to, if you turn in the, the quote unquote project for this deadline or whatever the case may be, I mean, are you more inclined to do it? Are we more inclined to procrastinate use reasons or justifications to not follow through. I'll do it tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. Well, and the more tomorrow thinking you attach yourself to, the less painful it is to use that tomorrow thinking and it becomes part of your personality. It becomes part of who you are. The lack of accountability to yourself becomes this sort of, like you said, self-fulfilling prophecy where it's always tomorrow, it's always later. It's the biggest weight loss lie anybody ever tells is I'll start over later tomorrow, I'll be better Monday, that kind of shit, because it's never true, but you get so much relief from thinking it. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the power of external pressure of accountability outside. And it doesn't have to be this uh, rigid or hurtful or disciplinary type of accountability. It really from our perspective, it's a much more curious accountability. It's really asking you the questions, getting your brain to come on board and start fighting for your goals instead of fighting against them and fighting for the old life that you're so used to, you know, you become so accustomed to, but don't love the consequences of. And so I think people kind of shy away from accountability because they think it's parental 
and rigid. And that's not how true accountability actually works. That's not how helpful accountability actually works. It's really a team effort. It's collaborative and it's getting you unstuck and into your next best decision as quickly as possible because no two paths are going to be exactly alike, even if the plan is good and similar. Yeah. Something that I'm always asking myself or used to ask myself and still do in some areas of life is like, why are we not doing the things that we say are important to us? You know, it's so frustrating. It's so maddening. We actually did a podcast episode about this very topic a few months back. You all can go check it out. But it's it's like, why do we why don't we follow through with the things that we say we want in life? And it is because we're human, right? But the reality is we can't achieve a goal if we're not even executing and nothing can become a habit if we aren't doing it consistently enough, long enough for it to become cemented into our identity. And it becomes something that we do instead of, or excuse me, someone that we are instead of something that we're just doing. And without that consistency, it's just never going to become our reality. And so ultimately, we need to just kind of recognize that humans aren't stupid. They're not lazy. I think a lot of this comes to just pursuing instant gratification instead of seeing the bigger reward and being able to delay that to an extent, which is where the accountability can be really valuable is because now we're not just kicking the can down the road in the same way. We kind of, again, there's a pain point there. You know, it's there has to be a pain point in order for people to take action generally. Otherwise, we do just prefer to stay where we are. That's kind of how the brain is wired. It's to keep ourselves safe and secure and comfortable. And that means not changing, not going against what is perceived as maybe unnatural or dangerous. And so we do have to kind of have these painful motivators. And one example of this is people who go to college, right? Most of that information that you're learning in pursuit of your degree, you can just literally Google nowadays. You can, but there is obviously a reward at the other end of it. But what motivates people to attend class consistently is oftentimes not wanting to blow the money that they spent on attending that class, getting that education. Because, I mean, they could just sleep in. They could just miss tests, flunk out, whatever, but then they would have to take it again, assuming they want the degree, right? And so the pain point is like, I really don't want to have to do this again. I don't want to spend this money again. So that motivates them then to take action. And interestingly enough, the research shows the more you spend on something, obviously the higher the pain point, right? Like, I don't know, somebody who values Louis Vuitton bags or whatever might be really crushed if they lose their $7,000 hand, $7, handbag at the airport or whatever. Whereas um, if it was just something that you got at Target, maybe not so painful. And so people value things that are obviously valuable and the more you spend, the more likely you are to show up and follow through and implement. So you got to get some skin in the game. There has to be a pain point there to motivate you. As much as people don't like to hear that, they just want to be ha uh, capable of having all the willpower and motivation in the world to complete the task. That's not really what the research shows at the end of the day. Well, and aside from financial motivators, because that's not a motivator for everyone, right? But it is for a lot of folks. But aside from that, the value and accountability is seeing that you already have a incentive and motivation to stay the same as well. So it's not just that you are not motivated and disciplined and don't have enough grit and you can't do it and all the things because you keep on falling on your face. It's really having someone to hold up that mirror and reflect back to you that you have competing motivators and the one that is keeping you stuck is the one that's consistently winning and you can't quite see that you don't see maybe necessarily the value that you are putting in being complacent and stuck 
And like you said, it's not that people are inherently lazy or something's wrong with them or anything else. We are highly distractible. <laughs> we are highly distractible by what feels most urgent and safest in the moment. The brain's job is to prioritize what feels safe, efficient, and all the things, right? Which is why when New Year's rolls around or when you try to put on your uh, the biggest jeans in your closet and they're starting to feel a little too tight and things like that, all of a sudden the brain prioritizes that. It's urgent, it's important, it's valuable, right now, right now, right now. But then as soon as you lose five pounds and they slide back over your bum, now regular comforts in life become the thing that is easiest and it distracts you and it pulls you back in. So having someone watch you and say, I see what you're doing. Do you see what you're doing here? Can you see how these dots are connecting? Can you see your brain? <laughs> I wish growing up, I would have had someone to say, here is your brain. Can you see it? Now I can see it in so many ways and it's fascinating. Can't always change it right away, but just the ability to step back and go, I can see what my brain is doing here. I'm noticing it. I'm seeing it. I'm sitting with it it helps me make a different decision. And that is a skill that I could not have developed on my own. Absolutely. When you think about the world's most successful individuals, right? Whether it's professional athletes or, I don't know, people like Elon Musk or Oprah Winfrey, Serena Williams, whatever the case may be, these individuals have coaches, they have boardroom members and people to hold them accountable, right? People to bounce ideas off of, get perspective from their minds, their brains, uh, share their wisdom and experiences. And so, you know, ask any coach who has ever been coached or anyone who has ever done anything meaningful and significant. Maybe we are going back to like, I don't know, getting your PhD or whatever the case may be. You're going to have some influencers in your life who held you accountable. It always touches on accountability for all of these big accomplishments in life, I would say. So I think that um, when we think about accountability, right, there is generally going to be, I guess one point that I wanted to kind of come back to is why do people actually work at their jobs? And the motivation is financial, right? There's a dual incentive there, I guess you could say, is financial. They get paid. And then the consequence on the other side of that, you can get fired and not get paid. So there's two kind of motivators there, right? And I know that that's a simple example, but it's still accurate. There is a benefit and a cost um, to having accountability. And those are the two things that I think really propel people forward in their goal is when you're looking at the context of coaching, accountability is by far the single biggest reason people do get results when they work with a mentor. That's just, like I said, a fact. And it's really something that I wanted to drive home in today's podcast episode because I just don't know that, you know, people are sitting at home beating themselves up. I'm a failure. There's something wrong with me. I need more self-discipline. And it's like, do you though? Maybe you're just focusing kind of on the wrong thing. Maybe what you really need is to try something different. Like we talked about different plan, different perspective, accountability to the plan and getting that guidance and expertise to take you to your goal. People who have taken clients similar to you and shown you what's possible. Because as I always say, your biggest barrier is your mind. It's not the food, which is where dieters want to focus all their attention. So Steph, is there anything else that you wanted to highlight or add here? I saw something the other day that someone was talking about. Um, I think she called it informed incompetence. And <laughs> it just really kind of blew my mind because it's something that we all experience where we are kind of in that I know what to do, but I'm just not doing it place where we have all the information we can get at this point. We know 
what we should be doing. We know the direction we want to go. We know the value of the direction we want to go, all that, but we haven't developed the skill to take action on it yet. And it's such a frustrating place to be. And that's kind of what this conversation reminds me a little bit of is that informed incompetence where we don't have the competence to follow through because we haven't developed the skill set in the way that it needs to be developed because we're always in such a hurry to change that we usually try to change everything all at once. We try to rush through the process. We don't learn anything and we, you know, kind of pass, fail, pass, fail, pass, fail over and over and over again instead of slowly building up competence to follow through when life gets lifey, when life gets tough, shortening the gap between when we're not following through and when we are and all of those things. And so I, I just, this conversation reminded me of that and how I was thinking about how clients come to us, usually informed through the podcast, through our YouTube videos, through social media posts, through what they've read and listened and learned or whatever. But there's still an incompetence and not in a negative way, an insulting way. Don't try to twist it and make it mean something about you. It just means you haven't developed the skill set yet to follow through. And that takes time and practice. And doing that within a container is so beneficial. Right. Yeah. The one other thing that kind of popped into my mind is consequences. <laughs> And I know I just kind of briefly touched on it a little bit earlier, but another reason, and it's an obvious one, so I'm not sure why I didn't really think about it too much sooner, is the consequence, again, of not following through. We are not very good at holding ourselves accountable. We tend to let ourselves off the hook. And so having a consequence in place, um, absolutely, once again, can drive the action and wanting to follow through and implement and being reminded over and over again of why this is valuable to you, why you want this. I mean, is there anything that dieters have worked longer and harder at than weight loss? And they always point their finger at like, I, I just need more willpower. I just need more self-discipline. It's like, really? You've been doing this shit for 20, 30 years and you think that willpower and discipline is your problem? Like what else in your life have you been doing for 20, 30 years or at least trying so long and hard at? That takes willpower. That takes dedication. That takes grit. So maybe, just maybe, um, you're not very good at giving yourself consequences. You're not very good at holding yourself accountable. Maybe you're not even very good at putting together a plan. No offense. I was there as well, but I, I just want to kind of highlight, give you all a little bit of tough love of what is it you think that's preventing you from losing weight in these past three to six months. What we've talked about here in this podcast is really just a handful of things. Which one most accurately represents you? Do you think it is because you don't have a plan, a clear plan? I'm not talking about just collecting those tips and tricks from social media, but do we actually have something cohesive, like a blueprint that an architect would have before they begin working with a builder and designing and, uh, excuse me, implementing the construction site and building whatever is on that blueprint, right? Do you need a new plan? And do you have accountability to the plan? That's what you need in order to be successful. Steph, that is it for me. Are you all set? All right, y'all, that is a head nod from Steph for those who are not watching this on YouTube, but maybe you should check it out. Uh, we're so much more fun to hang out with when you can see us in person than just here on the podcast. I did want to mention, speaking of accountability, I have a client that just graduated from my one-on-one -on -one coaching this week, so I'm going to be having an opening. I'd love to get someone new on my roster, so if you're interested, shoot me a DM or click in the show notes below and let's set up a time to meet and have a conversation and see if we're a good fit. In the meantime, I hope everyone has a great week and we will catch you on the next episode. Bye y'all.